Hey guys, checking back in in, well, on Lake Como in Italy. You guys can see Lake Como in the background. And we're here on the, basically on the border with the, with Switzerland. And we're in the northern, northeastern section of the lake. Uh, did the whole, whole lake in a boat yesterday, just absolutely beautiful area. But this is pretty much the one of the highly, most highly requested discussionals, if you will, that I've had for some time. And you guys have just been asking and asking more information on this. I'll do another video on it. And I've been kind of putting it off a little bit and thinking about whether I wanted to do it because I don't like to, I don't like to glorify certain things, and I really like to use my channel for teaching people and the betterment of the world as a whole is kind of my goal just helping people and and you know as you guys have seen with a lot of my outreach programs and stuff definitely don't like to you know brag in any way or anything like that or to I don't like to suck in followers uh, based off of uh, crazy stories and things of that nature but it's part of it you know it's part of my life and uh, it's part of my testimony actually so so today we're going to kind of delve into some, some of the, uh, some of the stories after my, I guess you could call it kidnapping in, in Germany and the, um, the joint task force uh, that was formed, you know, totally illegally, and, and specifically we'll talk about some German prison stories, and, uh, you know, it's a real blessing that I've been able to, you know, overcome all this in my life and. It's pretty crazy how, uh, you know, actually being part of a government cover-up and things of that nature, uh, just when it, when it comes down to it, and it's kind of like the stuff that you see in movies, and everybody thinks, oh, that can't be possibly real, and that never happens, and then it happens to you, and you think, uh, you think, wow, uh, you know, everything that I was taught, everything that I was told was kind of fake and false, and really just there's the world out there is a you know a very different place than the face that we like to put on it and kind of well I'm just gonna delve into that and tell you guys a little bit I'll give a for those of you who haven't seen there's a ton of other videos on what happened some of them have been taken down but some of them couple two of them got a million over a million views before they were taken down so pretty much everybody knows the story um, there's a bio on the website that was written up about kind of very briefly uh, my my life it's a it's a it's a it's a, just a brief biography uh, kind of a synopsis of facts so if you guys want to see something really short and just read you know the just basic facts only you can read that uh, but otherwise uh, let me get right into it So, uh, about a year ago, no, over a year ago now, I was in Europe, like I am now, traveling. Uh, executive protection, uh, working with some some of the largest growers of organic produce out of uh, Latin America. We had some, we were doing deals, you know, discussing deals. I was also acting as a translator as well, and the uh, I had flown in from El Salvador to Spain to Germany and at each airport I was uh, basically captured and held for 24 hours and interrogated by masked men um, who would, didn't tell, didn't reveal anything about themselves to me and put back on a plane 20, 23 hours, 23 and a half hours later the exact flight that I would have had the day before and then that happened, boom, happened in El Salvador, happened in Spain. When I got to Germany, it happened as well, and then they just released me into Germany and said, go about your business. Three days I was in, uh, Nur well, I was all around a day in Berlin. Two days I was in Nuremberg at a, at a big convention center there. And we were just having deals with some of these big buyers of uh, organic produce. The cardamom market went... Um, just went crazy and the guys that I work with ended up making you know almost a hundred million dollars in two years so 
uh, just, you know, the market was unbelievable for cardamom. Cardamom is a spice that is used m m mainly in India and the demand is so high that they can't grow it all over there. So 80% of it comes from Guatemala and that's why I've been spending a lot of time in Guatemala. This was right after I was spending all the time with the gold, working with the gold, then I started getting into the cardamom. Just as you guys know where there's really high money ticket items, people are always going to need security consulting and 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 uh and uh hard security services uh executive protection, private security, things of that nature. So getting into that and then so I was you know when I, when I got to Germany they did the whole interrogation they had been tracking my movements all around the globe and um, kept interrogating me trying to work up something and this has this had to do with my history with the US government which a lot of you guys know about so and uh, they kinda just weren't happy we weren't on good terms and they wanted to try and find something to kinda stick it to me and you know make me basically disappear and this is three failed assassination attempts later and then now they're working basically with uh, some rogue elements of the justice system Interpol Washington and some special forces from El Salvador uh, GSG 9 in Germany uh, which is actually a specialized few guys from GSG 9 uh, were the ones that were doing this. When I got to Germany, they did a, it's crazy, and they cut up my clothes and cut up my bag, and I was just chesting for all kinds of, any kind of residue or materials, anything they could find, found nothing, obviously. You guys don't, you guys know I do everything by the book, don't do anything illegal, so. Weren't able to find anything, they, they put a, these three guys were following me around in Germany for the whole three days, and I saw them, they weren't very good at being a tail. I told the guys I was with, hey guys, I got a tail. I knew what was going on. I had been in contact with the government in the U.S. and they were refusing to negotiate with me. They said, look, if you're doing something you shouldn't be, you're going to go down. And I was told, hey guys, I'm not doing anything I shouldn't be. Can we just, I, I don't, why are you guys following me around? Can we come to a, some kind of an agreement on this? And uh, they just said no, you know. They said there's no negotiation. They basically said we don't negotiate with terrorists. And I was like, wow, that's kind of uh, kind of crazy. So I had my lawyers working on this and they're like, you know, do they, is there any evidence against me of anything? No, but they're looking for it. So, the three days went by. They were trying to do everything they could to find any evidence against me to arrest me for anything they could. They couldn't. So then they they have they got this task force together. Uh, tri -na three nation three nations came together and created a task force of some rogue agents. And they <clears throat> they follow me, follow me, follow me. The third day, I go into this Nuremberg Messe, I think it was called, for more meetings, and I'd already done multi multi million dollar deals by this point it was the last day of our meetings and then from then on we were just going to vacation and enjoy the countryside and europe and all that which is what i'm doing right now finally a year and a half later but um went in there and and went to scan my badge and this time there was one of the guys i didn't see him but two of them were still following me at you know everywhere i went sitting in their car outside my hotel the whole nine and got into the place and went to scan my badge. And this is a massive convention center. I went to scan my badge and the badge didn't work. And then there was a guy over there dressed like he was, dressed like he was part of the convention center people. And uh, he told me, hey, is your badge not working? Uh, you need to go check with the help desk. And uh, I went over to check at the help desk, and I immediately knew what was going on. So on the way to the help desk, I told my buddy, I said, hey, you guys need to figure out what you need to do because I'm not going to be here for the rest of the trip. Like I told you, these guys are following me. They thought I was crazy. Um, they're, they're good friends of mine now, and I actually work with them. They're business partners now. At this point, they were still uh, clients. But he said, man, you're, you're crazy. That's not true. It's nobody's following you. You're paranoid. I said, okay. I said, well, look, you guys need to figure out how to do this the rest of the way. You're not going to hear from me anymore after today, but you know I may be fine, I may not be. But just go. You guys got to continue on without me. I don't need payment. I'll finish. You know, it was 50 50 percent up front. Usually, what I do, all expenses paid, and then 50 percent when we're done. But I was like, don't you know? You don't have to finish the payment, whatever. Okay. And he still at this point thought it was BS, and uh, went to get in the line to check at the help desk. Sat at the help desk. In line there, and two guys, the two guys that were following me came up and approached me from the other side of the the line thing there. There's like two people in line in front of me. And they said, uh, in German, uh, is your badge not working? 
and I said, excuse me, I don't speak German. You know, I understood what they said, but I was, just was the right thing to do at the time. See what was kind of feel them out. And they said, we can help you with that. Please come with us. I knew what was going on. So, you know, I was I weighed my I had weighed my options, and at this point, I'd already been in negotiations, trying to contact the I'd had contacted the embassy in Germany, nothing. The I'd contacted the German government; they wouldn't wouldn't offer any kind of amnesty, or I'd already contacted several Latin American countries, wouldn't offer any kind of amnesty. Uh, there's the Germany has a treaty with the U.S. where they can't offer amnesty to anybody that the U.S. is. Even if it's illegal, even if the U.S. was doing it illegally, they still can't offer amnesty because uh, they can't even... They, they, Germany doesn't... Actually, uh, the U.S. government in Germany has higher powers than the German government in a lot of areas, which a lot of people don't understand. Uh, German police cannot even arrest American military over there. Uh, they just have to let them do whatever they want. And anybody that's in the government, in, in the American government, can run rogue in Germany if they want to because Germany doesn't have control over Americans in Germany that are in a government role or military role. Citizens, if you're a citizen, you have no more rights than any German. And then, and it's the opposite. The American US citizen, unless you're in the role in the government, that doesn't apply. So, so I'm there, standing there, and they said, come with us. Well, I knew what was going on at that point. I, you know, I was tired of basically dealing with this. And I was like, you know, if, if they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. If they're going to, uh, yeah, I couldn't work anymore. I couldn't live anymore. If they're going to arrest me, you know, put me in some sort of a Guantanamo Bay type place, which is basically what they did, then whatever, I'm just going to deal with it. And uh, I had filmed my uh, kill capture video previously to that, and which the kill capture, when nobody heard from me in a few days after that, the kill capture video released, that went viral. Everybody heard my story. Um... And so I went with these two guys, you know, to a back room, and there was just 20, 30 guys in there, about 26 guys in there, just loaded to the teeth, SWAT team, but German type, basically the uh, uh, special police unit. Only three of the guys were from GSG-9, and the rest were just like a, basically a high elite German SWAT team. And so they really thought I was going to do something crazy, I guess. I don't know. I got back there, and they... They said, uh, hey, look, uh, they surrounded me. And at that point, they were actually pretty cool about it. They were like, uh, weapons roll on me, and they're like, how, how are we going to do this? Uh, do you know what's going on? And I was like, yeah, I know what's going on, obviously. I'm not stupid. They're like, are you going to be compliant? I was like, what am I going to do, man, you know? And they said, we, well, we have, uh, we're with a joint task force force initiated by Interpol Washington and we're here to arrest you and I said do you have charges in Germany against me and they said no there's no charges against you we've just been requested by the US government to detain you in Germany and I said well then you know are you gonna send me back to the US we don't know anything about that we're just so they wouldn't tell me anything they they arrested me there and then uh, start the interrogation process started and they just kept interrogating me and interrogating me for about 48 hours or so straight and it was it was rough you know but i'd already been that week i'd already been interrogated by uh el salvador uh special forces and spanish uh military guys and so it's just at this point i was i was happy that somebody was speaking english to me <laughs> which in el salvador they had a an american government you know alphabet whatever soup guy come in and oversee everything but he never spoke so nobody spoke english to me until this point I was like, well, at least I'm being tortured and interrogated in English for a change. <laughs> but um, went from there to Nuremberg Prison. And I was in the funny thing. They put me in a holding cell. I found out later it was where uh, Herman, I think his name, Herman Goering, the, the head of the Luftwaffe, actually popped a cyanide pill and killed himself in that same room. It was uh, where they held the Nuremberg trials. Very old prison. And there's several parts of the prison. And most people don't know this. Actually, almost nobody knows this. But there's one section of the prison that's like a Guantanamo Bay type place that's reserved for, that doesn't exist. It's off the books. So they put me in there under a false name and, and they said my charge was Wildefischen or something like that. I don't remember the name exactly in German, but it was uh, White Fishing is the direct translation. 
and it uh, fishing without a license. <laughs> Just unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. And uh, 23 hour lockdown. And I guess we'll get more into the, you know, you guys tuned in for German prison stories, so let's get more into it. And uh, Nuremberg was cold. The, the clothes were insufficient. This prison anyway, even if you're in any of the sections, it's the worst prison in Germany. Highly known as the worst prison in Germany. A lot of German prisons are really nice. Scandinavian prisons are like hotels. They're amazing. You get to cook your own food. They don't put locks on the doors. You can go bike riding through the town in some, in some of them. Uh, you know, Bulgarian prisons uh, follow the Soviet Union countries uh, are some of the worst in Europe and then Germany's right there in the middle but Nuremberg and in Bayern, Bavaria that area is uh, very strong ties to the Nazi community uh, very old, old, old money that dates back to the World War II era and a lot of very, very what you would call conservative Germans that don't like outsiders and they don't they don't apply themselves to the rules of the rest of Germany and the rest of the European Union and things of that type thing so there's a lot of uh, there's chemical lobotomies that go on in there there's a lot a lot of people come into the country as trying to be refugees or from if you come into the country from certain areas in Africa or certain thir like I said follow the Soviet Union countries and cause a problem in there they they'll give you a chemical lobotomy and they know how to do it they 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 leave you for a certain amount of time and they if nobody con comes to contact you a lot of oh middle eastern and, and african countries as well and what they'll do is they'll they'll bring these people in for passport checks even if they're not committing any crimes depending on what country they're from because they're in germany seeking asylum they have no family really worried about them or at least no family with money so there's nothing these people can do about it and a lot of them are real gangsters you know a lot of them are real bad people so uh, i'm just stating the facts here i'm not saying my opinion which i am a i am a, you know i don't th i think everybody should be treated fairly but then i've also seen people in prison that were just not human beings you know they're just evil evil people to the core no good in them do I think they should be treated unfairly? No, but they definitely deserve to be in prison. You know, they're they're a menace to society, a real menace to society, and I've seen a lot of people like that. So there was people like that there. There was one guy, a uh, Russian guy, and he was a, a Russian uh, crime boss, and he, I never knew him when he was supposed to be this tough guy. And uh, when I was there, he would come around shuffle, like with eyes half closed, and, and knock his coffee cup They'd open the cells on my block for one hour and uh, every morning, and this was big time criminals where I was at, and guys they were basically trying to hide. There was several guys in there suspected of terrorism, and uh, they were basically never going to get out. They weren't giving them lawyers. They didn't give me a lawyer. No access to anything. They're just you. You don't have phone calls going out. You don't have mail going out. Nobody knows you're there for some of, for some of us that were there. And that was my case. I was there for 48 days, and nobody everybody thought I was dead. Nobody knew where I was at. And uh, this guy, this Russian crime boss guy, according to what the other people told me who he was before, there was a lot of Russian uh, organizational crime people there. And uh, he would come by and just like kind of knock his coffee cup on the door in that one hour that the door was open every day. The door was open every day for an hour and you could sh there was a community shower. You'd go shower and then 23 hour lockdown or 22 hour lockdown depending they they'd let you go outside for like 45 minutes but it was so cold outside and the clothing was so insufficient that I almost never went outside unless I just went out and worked out constantly for that 45 minutes but I usually worked out for that 45 minutes in my cell because it was that cold but um he would come around and and he was he didn't recognize his friends anymore he didn't he could barely speak and he just he was addicted to coffee so he would just come at that hour and he would just kind of try and get coffee from people just sad to see, but uh, but they'd give you, they call it the bunker, and it was like underneath where we were at, and they put you in there and give you this chemical lobotomy, and then I was talking to some of the trustees that work that unit, and they can't, the people, once they got it for like a month, they could barely feed themselves or drink or anything. They couldn't talk at all, and then finally your brain starts to adapt to these drugs that they're giving you, and you, you come back a little bit. And you're like a th about a third grade level is the highest you ever reach after you get that whatever kills you off. But that's what they do for for people who are violent 
and people who don't have uh, people who were at the state that I was where there's they don't allow contact with the outside world and they watch you for a certain amount of time and if you have so many people trying to find out where you're at and luckily I still had some contacts that had I had friends in high places and a lot of enemies in high places but the few friends in high places were continually contacting and you know they were able to find out where I was at um but I'm not going to say that it was that 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 got me out of there. 100 percent was not that. The only thing that, the only reason I'm alive today and you know able to share my story is because uh, it was a high, you know God thing. I, you know, there's absolutely nothing I did. I don't want to share these stories and have tell you you know tell you guys that I'm some kind of a Superman or you know super spy or you know top level secret agent. I'm just a guy and I you know. I didn't get lucky in any way, you know, I definitely have a skill set, but it's all God-given, you know. I've been in a lot of really hard, really tough, really terrible situations and have survived by, by providence, fate, and uh, divine intervention, and have learned lessons coming through them, obviously, and of course, but, but nothing of my own power. There's no human being on earth, or who's ever lived, really, other than maybe Jesus, <laughs> that could have survived these things on his own so it wasn't you know i'm not bragging here i want you guys to know right away i'm sharing these stories now to just get the truth out there because i don't like to see a lot of the stories you guys know i've been a they started a defamation campaign when they finally finally released me and just started circulating all kind of crazy stories they said i was never outside the u.s uh which is just obviously blatantly false but um, they took the videos down completely erased from the internet that had over a million views my kill capture video and the video of me in Germany after I had just been released from interrogation uh, before I went to prison there and after the interrogation I was there, like I said there I was there for three days and I did a whole video while I was on the Autobahn from on my way from Berlin to Nuremberg and that video was taken down, a live feed, and that video was taken down. A lot of you guys, over a million of you guys have seen that video, and over a million of you guys have seen the other video as well, but it's gone. Completely erased from the internet. Like it never existed. They even took down affiliate links that were sharing that video, which I don't know who has the power to do that. But, well, I do, but I don't know who's doing it. But, um, I guess well, let's, get, let's get into some more German prison stories. Uh, tell a couple more before I sign off here. Uh, but guys, make sure you subscribe to the channel. I think what do you what's what do you got to do? Click the bell or something like that so you get the notifications. And uh, comment right now. First of all, pause this video and share it because the main reason I'm trying to tell these stories is to share my story and share the truth. Create some you know eye opening for for the American pop population because you know everywhere else in the world people are aware of government corruption. For some reason in America we're just not. We think it doesn't exist. And uh, so pause this right now, share this video, and comment below your thoughts and what you want to see more of. So tell another little story. My in my block there was single cells all the way down and there was a there was a three man cell on the first thing and after I got my own after I got released from that go goering cell uh, I got put into the three-man cell which I was happy with because I would have you know I didn't want to be by myself like everybody else on the block was for 23 hours a day and I didn't have I had a bunch of cash with me and US cash I hadn't transferred to euros yet and they told me because it was in US dollars that I wouldn't be able to use it so I the foods just they feed you twice a day and uh, only one hot meal and just just t tiny portions terrible food and uh, they you're allowed to they have a really big commissary list of stuff you can buy but I didn't have any money so I made friends with one of my roommates really cool guy tell you which I'll get into right now tell you about the whole roommates and stuff like that and uh, I'll tell you about that and but he was Okay, I had two roommates that I had several roommates throughout the time I was there, but the two that were there for the long I had one guy from Thailand who didn't speak much English. He didn't speak much anything other than Thai, but he had killed his his neighbor with a knife, uh, and he was there for that, which 
probably, you know, I think he got sentenced to 10 years and then went to prison while I was there. Uh, there was another guy that was in my room who was a uh, really cool uh, guy, like 6'9", uh, Dutch guy uh, from DJ, really cool dude, from the Netherlands. Um, that was also like one of the biggest drug dealers. <laughs> And he had this, which he, I was talking to him, and he had this fleet of vehicles that had the secret compartments in the back, and you would, like, put the radio on a certain station, turn one of the turn signals on, and do something else with the air conditioning. I don't remember exactly what it was, but secret compartment would open in the back, and there'd be drugs in there, and he told me that he, you know, he just got bored, basically, and enjoyed the rush of doing it so he would actually still do it himself and he had his whole family with him and brought a bunch of drugs in his car crazy crazy story but uh i haven't heard from him since i got out and he, i gave him all my contact information when i was there so he's obviously still there but um he uh he got there was a snitch on the german side so they they arrested him from that uh the guy that he, he ended up selling his drugs to caught him. Otherwise, he would have never been caught. But um, he had a bunch of money, and uh, he would, I was, he had never, you know, he was big, real big guy, but he had never been in jail before, and never knew anything, didn't know anything about jail, and he was, uh, you know, really, really cool, and really like, uh, you know, he was a DJ, so, but, but he was the type of person that wouldn't have fared well in a prison environment. So I kind of took him under my wing a little bit, and uh, I was teaching him some Muay Thai and things of that nature, and I taught him how to hold himself to where, you know, he kind of wanted to just be cool and friends with everybody, and I, I you know, immediately told him, kind of watched him for a couple days when he was in the room and realized he was just a cool, straight-up, you know, down-to-earth guy, and I told him day two, I was like, hey, look, man, not everybody in here is your friend, you know, you're going to get effed, it screwed over big time if you keep acting the way you act you're you're gonna get yourself in a world of hurt it's gonna be worse than it already is you know he's, he's missing his family you know he you know, he cried one time and and you know there's absolutely nothing against that i'm not saying anything bad about crying men cry i've cried before so it's you know uh, but you in prison you don't want to let other people see tears in your eyes it's just a thing you know um but kind of took him under my wing and then he, he bought it he was buying a bunch of commissary and a bunch of food so then we got we started eating together making meals together you know uh trying to get you know real fit and in shape and eating healthy and that was cool because my last half of my time in there i ate, ate good which night and day difference you know changes your the way you stay it went from you know really bad it's gradually getting better to the point, you know, where it's where I'm at now, where it's all it's all it's all covered up. Now they act like it never happened, and I'm just traveling the world and enjoying my life again. So, uh, definitely an experience. But so that was you know that was that that was uh that was him, and that was my role with him. And the other guy that I spent the most time in the room with was a Lithuanian guy, and I had initially had some problems with him, and uh. It, that was the my only problems that I had when I was there revolved around him and uh, he was connected with organized crime elements of Eastern Europe so it wasn't just him you know it was one of those things and when we first got in the room he ordered a TV pretty early and I set the rules for my room and you know somebody's got to because these guys are just animals and you're living in a zoo somebody's got to make rules so I set the rules for my room and uh, I told him, you know, he liked to have the windows open. It's below zero outside. I'm from Florida. I told him, look, you can have the windows open for an hour a day. You can put the TV on the Russian channel for an hour a day. Neither one of us here in the room want the windows open. There's three of us. We're going to have a democracy rule, I told him. We have an hour a day on BBC an hour a day on Russian channel and then other than that I'd like some quiet time because I don't want the TV on all day I don't want to turn my mind to mush hour a day you can have the windows open I don't want to freeze all day long I'll wear I'll put my all my jacket and all my clothes on stuff like that for your hour that you can have your window open other than that I'm not sitting around the room dressed like I'm, I live in 
Antarctica. So, you know, he was accepting of that at first. And he kind of slowly started to play the role of like, oh, I don't understand English, which he didn't speak much English. But he understood. And then, you know, it got to like a passive aggressive thing where he would, you know, be upset because me and the other guy would talk and kind of chill and hang out and he would get jealous, I guess. And you got to understand when guys are living in the same, in a, in a, in a basically a little tiny, tiny little space for, for, you know, every day, all day, basically. The only time I didn't see him was when he went outside for 45 minutes a day. So I saw him all the rest of the day, every day. And trying to give the most accurate account that I can memory serves me so basically it got to the point where uh, he would start opening the windows more and then he would get upset about something and go open the window and or put the TV on the Russian channel and then one day I forget what he was I can't remember what he was upset about he thought we were making fun of him and we weren't well maybe we were but not like in a not in a super negative way maybe just you know having a laugh and I was probably guilty a little bit of, you know, making fun of him. And uh, it wasn't anything crazy, but like I say, when you're in the room the whole time with all these guys, we were having a laugh at his expense. He didn't like it. He went to put the TV on the Russian station, and he uh, went and opened all the windows in the room, even the windows on my side. And I was furious immediately because I, you know, I just... So I picked up my Bible, which is the only thing I had, and started reading my Bible because I didn't want to kill this guy. I mean, point blank period is the truth. And uh, he just came over to my side of the room and opened the window on my side of the room just to piss me off. So I'm like, you know, in my mind, I'm like, you wanna, do you want to go this route? Let's go this route. So I'm reading my Bible, I'm reading my Bible. And he's sitting there and he's look, you know, kind of looking at me out of the corner of his eye, doing his passive aggressive thing. And I'm trying to, I'm praying and I'm saying, you know, I, I'm going to lose it. I don't know what to do here. God, please help me not to kill this guy. And uh, he turns the volume up on the TV 10 minutes into it. And I just, I couldn't handle it anymore. And I went over and I picked him up and I body slammed him on his bed. <laughs> and it broke his bed and his bed there's two bunk beds on my side and he had like a bed hanging off the wall on his side broke the bed and uh and he wouldn't get up he wouldn't do anything and I didn't hurt him you know I picked him up and slammed him on his bed soft beds and uh he wouldn't do anything and he had been storing so I completely forgot this part of the story to lead up to this he had been stor taking razor blades out of his razor and storing them but he was doing it so I could see it and he was doing that as part of his plan. This guy had been in prison most of his life, so he knew uh, he was a life criminal. He knew his, what he was doing, and he was hiding these razor blades. And it, that was his way of saying to me, "Hey, like you got to sleep in here. I've got razor blades. Don't do anything to piss me off." So I went, and he kept his razor blades in a magazine. So I went and got one of his razor blades. But he was sitting on the bed. He wouldn't get up. I'm yelling, screaming, telling him to get up, telling him if he wants to have a problem with me, make this problem. Got one of his razor blades, handed it to him, and told him, "Here, now you got a now. If you feel like you don't have, if you feel like that uh, it's not fair fight, now you got a razor blade. What are you gonna do?" He just put the razor blade on the ground, wouldn't do anything. I gave him a coffee cup and said, "Look, hit me with this." He wouldn't, still wouldn't do anything, and you know, they, we had a chair in the room. I pick up the chair, I broke it because I didn't want to just you know beat this guy up. If he if he wanted to have you know a problem with me, I wanted it to settle it like men. You know, have a fight like a man, but I'm not just gonna bully him because that's not me. And uh, you know, meanwhile, I'm just raising hell in the room, and everybody on the block is listening, which I didn't know at this time. Everybody was listening. I wasn't thinking about that. I was just trying to control myself to not hurt this guy, and I didn't. I'm really happy that I didn't. After that, we were friends, and and he never again violated the rules of the room. So we were cool, man. I, I, he he's actually emailed me. <laughs> He saw one of my videos and saw that I had the, I gave him my contact information when I left. He saw that I had the rosary on and I wore it, the, I got the rosary in prison there. And I wore it until it broke. And he said, hey, I know you're out because I see the rosary on your neck on one of my YouTube videos. Awesome, man. You know, good. And, um, and you know, 
I'd like to apologize to him. If you're watching this, I'd like to apologize for making fun of you and for that whole situation. And uh, but I'm really glad that what happened happened because nobody got hurt, and you know we've kept in contact. So uh, that was that situation, and it expanded a little more because from then, like I said, everybody was listening. And then I went out on the yard for that exercise period, and a couple guys came up to me and said, "Man, what happened in your room?" You know, because we have no entertainment, and everybody heard it. The yard's right here. And then all the blocks go around the yard and everybody has their windows open. So everybody on the whole, not just my block, but everybody on the whole, all three blocks surrounding the yard heard the commotion. And which is hilarious, the guards in there are so scared of people. If you if you fight, they just call the riot team in and then they bring you to the bunker. They don't even, one guard won't go and try and break anything up. They just let you do your thing and then they medicate you. But, uh... Yeah, just just crazy story, and um, so from the finally, I'll tell you, medical is every Tuesday morning. If you get up super early in the morning, and when when they open your hatch at 5:30 a.m., if you're there in time, I'm cl in closing with this. If you're there in time to slide this little blue medical card through the door to give it to the officer, and if they like you, they'll if you're cool with them, they'll let you go to medical. It's the only thing you can do once a week recreationally. So I would go and tell them I had a different medical condition every Tuesday to let me get out of the cell, you know. And it's the only time you get to see other people other than on the yard. Well, this story had spread so much. This guy's connections with Lithuanian crime underworld, I happened to go up there to medical, and at this, this, he told them, hey, this guy goes up to medical every Tuesday. Well, all the Lithuanian crime guys were up there in medical. And they, they put us in all a holding cell together waiting to see the doctor. Well, I'm in there with like seven Lithuanian guys and me and my buddy that's 6'9", and we square off in there. And these guys are like, the guy comes over to me, the boss of the Lithuanian crime guys, and he's like, you know, broken English, hey, you, you, you need to respect my friend, you know, which is the roommate guy. And I'm like, hey, man, I respect everybody. I don't remember the exact dialogue, but it was a prison standoff, and he said, you need to do this, and I said, I respect everybody, but if you got a problem with me, we can have it out right here. You know, seven on two. And, uh, and you know, it was very tense. Nothing ended up happening. Uh, very, very tense for a little while, obviously. They they didn't want to fight, and I, and I didn't provoke it to the point, but I stood my ground and, and told them, hey, if you want to fight, we'll fight now. Uh, nothing happened. I found out later that he had AIDS. So I'm so, so glad and blessed that nothing happened, which is just, he found out, he got in there and found out the German medical prison, that's the only great thing about the German prison system is they have amazing medical. But this guy found out in prison that he had AIDS. So he had nothing to live for. He was already facing life in prison in Germany, being a Lithuanian guy. And then found out he had AIDS when he got in there so just I don't know why it didn't fight another god thing but you know I, I'm gonna run here just wanted to check in with you guys like I said much requested story questions comments below please let me know what you want to see more of bone out Well guys, we are on the other side of Lake Como today, and you guys know what this is, shameless plug, the most effective self-defense tool in the world, but uh, you guys probably are here for the beautiful villa, Lake Como Villa, you guys know what about this. and I will also, in a future video, Probably in this video, actually, by the time I do it, but I'll do a little walkthrough here for you guys and tell you some cool stories, probably tomorrow, but 
like I say, it'll be most likely in this video. We've got a pretty cool house here, as you can see. Lake Como, Italy. This one's way up in the mountain. Master bedroom. Guest bedroom. One of my favorite features is actually the bathroom. So I'll show you guys the bathroom. It's got a steaming shower. So the shower turns itself into a steam room. It's got a bidet. For those of you who are into that kind of thing. And uh, the shower has these steam ports here. I don't know if you can see them. Turn the light on in here. It's got these steam ports. Very modern look. Everybody's going to the modern look in Italy these days. But uh, showers got some steam ports where they actually will steam and basically create a steam steam room while you're taking a shower. Anyway, uh, let's get right into some cool story time or something like that that we'll cut into next. Let me know if you like this house or the other place that we stayed in uh, in Lake Como or actually just comment below the coolest place that you've ever thought that I stayed. This one is ranking pretty high on my list. <laughs>